Well, it is Easter Sunday, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, God is love. Turn to your other neighbor and say, God is love. Amen. And church, he loved the world so much that he sent his only son. Have you ever asked yourself, why would God do something like that? I mean, here's a whole human race, not a good one in the bunch. I'm not talking about y'all. Y'all are in church. I mean, everyone that's not in church today. You know what I'm saying? Here's this whole human race and not a good one in the bunch. And Jesus would take his position from heaven and come into an earth that was full of sin, being lorded over by Satan, the people backbiting, just following after their father, the devil. You see, church, God didn't have to do it. He could have just let the world go and destroy itself, but thank God he's love. Everyone say, he is love. He is love. He didn't create man to be lorded over by an outlaw God. He created man. You know why he created man? Because God is love, and he wanted somebody to share this love with. Hallelujah. And you know what he did? He created man in his very own image. Right. And God created man in his very own image, and as a result of that, he could lavish that love within him on man that was created in his class. Hallelujah. But because of sin, man lowered himself. And God could have just turned his back in that moment and let the world go and destroy itself and all of mankind go to hell. But thank God that because of that love and because of that desire to love man, he took his son out of that precious place and caused him to come into the flesh. Get into a sinful world. Get in a place where sin was just lording over. Satan was just lording over everything in it. And then not only that, he took it a step further and made his son partaker of the nature of Satan, his very own enemy. Why would he do that? To love man. To love mankind. Amen. And as a result of it, he knew all along how it was going to work out. Glory to God. You see, God believes in Luke 6, 38 too. The Bible says, give and it shall be given back unto you. That's a basic law of God, church. God gave his own son and you know what? He was believing for a return. A whole family and it worked. Say, thank you, Jesus, it worked. Thank you, Jesus, it you see, worked. this God I'm talking about, this father of love, he sent his only son and made him to be sin for us so that you and I would have the ability to once again have right standing with God. Yes, amen. Today we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, Christ's great victory over the enemy, over death, hell, and the grave. That's right. And the thing is, there's been a lot of sermons preached on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but there has not been a lot of sermons preached on the gifts that followed that resurrection for the body of Christ. And we're going to be talking about, to me, in, in my eyes, the most important one, the most important gift that was given through that resurrection was righteousness. Amen. Righteousness. Right standing with God. Yes. And so since Jesus was resurrected today, we're going to resurrect something today. We're going to resurrect righteousness, and, it, and it's on the inside of each and every one of us. Yes. We're going to learn about that it's a gift Amen. that was freely given because Jesus was resurrected. Amen. We had the ability to once again have right standing with God, and as a result of it, you know what he did? He filled us with his very own nature. Paul said that therefore is by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, thank you, Adam, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So what Paul was saying is through what happened in the Garden of Eden by the offense of Adam, all men were condemned. Spiritual death reigned on all men, but much more, everyone say much more. Much more. Much more than the ability of spiritual death to reign upon all men was the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Yes. Hallelujah. You see... If the work that God did in Jesus at Calvary could not produce righteousness, right standing with God for all men, then that would mean the work that Satan did in Adam in the Garden of Eden would have been more effective than what God did in Jesus at Calvary. Does everyone see this? But thank God it wasn't. He said much more. Everyone say much more. You see, what happened in the Garden of Eden caused spiritual death to reign on all men. All men were condemned, but much more was the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Everyone say the free gift. Free. How many of you all like free gifts? Yeah. Amen. This is one you can't live without. Amen. This is a free gift. What do you do when somebody hands you something? You receive it. Some of you all are sticklers in receiving. I won't name names. Somebody wants to bless you financially, give you a gift, you receive it wholeheartedly. 
because you know that something's going to come up and you're going to be able to bless somebody else too. But this was a free gift. Everyone say free gift. Free gift. And it's righteousness. And what do you do? You have to say, all right, Lord, I'll take that. Amen. Now, here's what he's saying. The gift of righteousness has already been provided. He said this gift has come upon all man. Everyone say all man. All man. It didn't say just all the Christians. He said all man. You see, all sinners, all mankind in the world, because of Adam what, and what he did, were condemned. Even if they weren't in the Garden of Eden and sin like Adam sinned, they were still in condemnation. All right, so much more than that was the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So the gift of righteousness came upon all man. And it's like a covering, church. It's like a, that covering over all of mankind. But you know as much as I do that all men are not enjoying that righteousness because all men have not received Jesus Christ as Lord of their life yet. And that's the only way this righteousness can be enjoyed is when you receive Jesus as Lord of your life. But nevertheless, the righteousness is there. It's here for, to be enjoyed. And all we have to do is receive Jesus, and it becomes a part of you and me. Hallelujah. It's just like electricity in this place. You know, there's plenty of electricity in here, in this building right now, to run the lights, the sound equipment, and everything we need to operate as a church. But I don't have to go down to the local electric company down the road and say, hey, we're going to be in here next week, so it'd be great if you turn the electricity on. That'd be great. Thanks. The bills are paid. There's plenty of electricity in here, but did you know it would never be enjoyed, this power, unless somebody turned on the switch? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. There, there was no way that this could be enjoyed unless somebody flips the switch, but nevertheless, it's here. Well, that's the way that righteousness is. It's a free gift of righteousness, and it's here for the world to enjoy, but if somebody doesn't turn the switch on, it can never be enjoyed. Amen? How many of you all are going to turn the switch on? Yeah. Hallelujah. Does everyone understand this? Yes. Well, praise God. The way that you enjoy righteousness, your right standing with God, is simply receive Jesus as Lord of your life, and you receive Jesus by faith, and you receive the righteousness of God by faith. 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 That's right. You receive Jesus by faith. You know that when you receive Jesus, you're going to heaven. Your sins have been forgiven. That's faith. You know for a fact nobody can talk you out of your salvation. No. If somebody came to you and said, you're not going to heaven, you'd be like, get behind me, Satan. I receive Jesus. You have a confidence and assurance. That's faith. It's simple, right? It's simple. Nobody can talk you out of your salvation. Nobody should be able to talk you out of your right standing with God either because it's by faith. That's how you receive this gift. Amen? Amen. And I will show you this in the third chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. It's about to get real good. It says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith, in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Did you notice that? The righteousness of God is by faith. It's a free gift, and you receive it by faith. faith. It's received by faith to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Anybody else ever heard this scripture? Yeah. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I think if, if you've been to, uh, to church at any period of your time growing up, everybody has heard this scripture. Now, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice how Satan has deceived man. I want us to read from verse 21, Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, all the way through 26, and you're going to notice that this is all one sentence, specifically in the King James Version of the Bible. The Apostle Paul isn't even through talking, and you know what man have done? They have taken out Romans 3.23 and preached on sin, 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 and Paul wasn't even talking about sin. He was talking about righteousness, and I want us to notice this. So let's read it. It says in verse 21, Romans 3, 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. What was he talking about here? Righteousness. Everyone say righteousness. 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 All the way through he was talking about it. And you see what he was saying? All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no difference though. Nevertheless, the righteousness of God has come upon all men. Amen. 
Now, somebody might say today, well, Pastor Jesse, don't you know that the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one? Well, that's exactly what the Bible does say, and that's exactly why Jesus had to come. Right. Hallelujah. You see, that came from the Old Testament. That came when, before Jesus was made sin. That came before he hung on the cross. That came before we were made the righteousness of God. And there was none righteous, no, not one. No one had right standing with God like we are talking about this morning. And Jesus came and was made sin so that all men could have right standing with God once again. Now, somebody else might say, well, Pastor Jesse, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Well, that's exactly what the Bible does say, but I'm not talking about my righteousness anymore. He said, declare his righteousness, and I'm talking about Jesus' righteousness, and praise God, his is not filthy. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm not talking about my filthy righteousness. I did away with that the moment that I received Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. And in that moment, he gave me his righteousness. And I'm not declaring mine. I'm declaring his. And his is not filthy, praise God. His righteousness caused him to enjoy victory the entirety of his life. And that same righteousness enables me to enjoy victory every day of my life too. And so, do, and so it does for you. Somebody might say, well, how can you say you're righteous? Sounds like you're boasting. Well, Paul said that we are as boasting men, and it included by what law? Works? Nay, but by the law of faith. And I say to you today that I am the righteousness of God, and I'll say it before anybody else who wants to hear it without boasting. Why is that? It's excluded by what law? The law of faith. Now, if I were to stand up here and say I'm righteous because look at all my good works, look at all the cans I picked up in the ditch, I mowed my neighbor's lawn, look at me, I'm so righteous, you'd have a right to run me out of town. But I didn't say that. I said, I'm righteous because Jesus came to, to be made sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you hear me this morning? Yes. And I'm declaring his righteousness. And so boasting is excluded by the law of faith. Amen. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. And while you're turning there, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, he said, Awake unto righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He told that Corinthian bunch, Awake unto righteousness and sin not. He said, For some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Church, if you are not operating in your right standing with God, it's a shame. And when you begin to understand this and get a revelation of that, that we have right standing with God, you know what that will do to sin? Kick it away, remove it, and that same righteousness provides for you. If you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, even the righteous Jesus Christ, and all you have to do is confess it as a sin, and he is faithful and true to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, if we are going to say we've been made the righteousness of God and we have right standing with God, then we need to begin to develop a right standing with God consciousness, amen, or a right standing consciousness, a righteousness consciousness. And if we are going to say we've been made the righteousness of God, then we need to begin to be aware of that right standing with God in ourselves. And we need to begin to develop within us a right standing with God consciousness, amen. We need to know for a fact we've been made the righteousness of God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. For if animal sacrifices could once and for all eliminate sin, they would have ceased to be offered, and the worshipers would have been cleansed, would have had a clean consciousness. Instead, once was not enough, so by the repetitive sacrifices, year after year, the worshipers were continually reminded of their sins, with their hearts still impure. The old system of living under the law presented us with only a faint shadow, a crude outline of the reality of the wonderful blessings to come. Speaking of uh, Jesus dying on the cross here. Even with its steady stream of sacrifices offered year after year, they still, there still was nothing that could make their hearts perfect before God. For what power does the blood of bulls and goats have to remove sin's guilt? Now, I want you to notice here in chapter 10 that under the law, it was only a shadow of the good things to, to come. It was a shadow of Jesus coming and dying on the cross, shedding his blood permanently for all of mankind. He said those sacrifices that they offered under the law, it, was only, uh, it, it, was, it could never do away with sin is what it was saying. You see, they offered the blood of bulls and goats and calves and lambs for the sin of the people. And God actually had a legal right to destroy the people because they broke the covenant. But instead of destroying his people. Do you know what he did? He took the blood of a goat or a lamb on the behalf of the people. 
And that blood, that blood of bulls and goats, could not do away with their sins. It only atoned for them, which means covered. Everyone say, it only covered their sins. It only covered their sins. It just covered their sins. But every year, the high priest had to go back and offer the same sacrifices for the same sins year after year after year. And he said that those sacrifices could never make the worshipers perfect, or in other words, could never give them right standing with God. It only covered their sins. And he went on to say, if it could, if the blood of bulls and goats could have gotten rid and made the worshipers perfect they, and given them right standing with God, he said, wouldn't they have stopped making the sacrifices to God? But it could never do that. The blood of bulls and goats could never do away with sin. And it could never get, away from, get us away from the guilt that sin provided. It kept us in a constant state yeah. of sin consciousness. Yeah. The blood of bulls and goats kept us there. That's right. yeah. But the blood of Jesus, uh, when it talked about this was only a, a crude outline of the things to come, that was a representation of what was coming that was going to be permanent, that would last forever. Yeah. And he said, under the law, the blood of bulls and goats could never do that. The blood of bulls and goats could never do away with sin, could never make the worshipers perfect. And if it could, they would have stopped making the sacrifices. And the people would have had no more sin consciousness. Yeah. They would have instead have a consciousness of of forgiveness. Yes, yes. And that only comes through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And once again, under the law, this could never happen. Under the blood of bulls and goats, this could never happen. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. But now the anointed one has become the king priest of every wonderful thing that has come. For he serves in a greater, more perfect heavenly tabernacle, not made by man, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He has entered once and forever into the holiest sanctuary, not with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the sacred blood of his own sacrifice. That is incredible. You don't see no cow carrying their blood into the holy of holies. That was man's doing. That was man's doing. An unpure vessel yeah. took the blood of bulls and goats just to cover, that, to atone, temporarily blot out. Lord, you don't see this, but it says here, the sacred blood of his own sacrifice Jesus carried into the, into the holy of holies, the holiest sanctuary. I just get an incredible vivid picture of Jesus when he was in hell. He has a pitcher full of his blood, and he goes right to the throne room and says, God, here it is. And God looks at it and says, that's enough. That's enough. It's just incredible. <laughs> incredible. Yeah. But the sacred blood of his own sacrifice, and he alone has made our salvation secure forever. He alone. Who is it? Jesus. Yes. Under the old covenant, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. Yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciousness? Remove sin's guilt, for by the power of the eternal spirit, he has offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice that now frees us from our dead works to worship and serve the living God. Did you get that? Yeah. He said in chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats could never make the worshipers perfect, and if it could, they would have stopped making the sacrifices, and the people would have had no more sin consciousness. Then in the ninth chapter, which we just read, it says, but thank God the blood of Jesus did do it. The blood of Jesus didn't just cover your sin. The word atonement in the New Testament says remit, do away with, hallelujah. Amen. Colossians chapter 2 says he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances, the mandates that were against mankind. Do you know what that means? Here's an example. Have you ever borrowed money from a bank? Have you ever borrowed money from a bank and you paid your note regular and every time you paid that note, your statement said, Mark paid, Mark paid, Mark paid. And then you finally get that thing completely paid off and they take that big old red stamp and they put it on the top of that thing, paid, praise God. Well, maybe not the praise God part, but you praise God that it was paid, right? Yeah. You see that big old thing, paid. And they send you a copy of it, paid in full. You owe them no dime anymore. You're completely free. And did you know that they send you a copy and they keep a record of your loan? so that they can look back on it if they had to and see what took place. They keep record of it. But you know what the blood of Jesus did? You see, mankind was in debt to God. We owed God a ton, church, and we could not pay it back. We gave our authority over to Satan thanks to Adam. And we were in debt to God, and we owed a huge note, and it was against mankind. But you know what the blood of Jesus did? It not only paid that note in full, but it blotted out the handwriting against us. You know what that means? 
there is no longer any evidence that there was ever any sin committed. Amen. It's okay to shout now. Yes, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. There was no, there's no ev longer any evidence through the blood of Jesus that there was even a sin committed. But we have a major problem. We tend to bring it up. <laughs> and we tend to get alone. And we tend to beat ourselves over the head with the past mistakes, living in regret, 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 remorse, remorse, remorse. And we go nowhere. We just spin in circles That's right. That's and go nowhere. That was not God's intention for you. His blood covered and completely blotted out the sins that you have committed. Stop bringing them up. Jesus don't know what you're talking about. Amen? He doesn't know what you're talking about. Stop wasting his time doing that. You praise God that you're free, and whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Praise God. In the eyes of God and in the supreme courts of this universe, it's as though mankind has never owed God a dime. Because the blood of Jesus did away with it. In the eyes of God, I just got crucified with Christ. In the eyes of God, I just got, you just got crucified with Christ. And as Romans talks about, while we were yet sinners, Jesus did that for you. Jesus did that for me. When we didn't even know Jesus, we were running from God, God haters, living the way of the world, doing our own thing, going straight to hell. Jesus said, you're worth it. And he died for you. We were crucified with Christ because of what Jesus did. And God remembers my sins and iniquities no more. He sees me just like he sees Jesus. He sees you just like he sees Jesus. And he sees Jesus perfect, spotless, without blemish. Well, if the blood of Jesus did away with our sin, Paul said in Hebrews 10 that if the blood of bulls and goats could remit and do away with sin, they would have ceased to, to offer those sacrifices. Well, church, I'm happy to tell you that the blood of Jesus did entirely away with sin. And did you notice we don't even have to offer any more sacrifices? What a messy job. Who would want to be in charge of that? Jesus said, I'll do it. And it'll just take one time. Hallelujah. He said... Once and for all, he offered himself, and it worked. That means we don't have to operate in a constant state of sin consciousness. We can operate now through Jesus in a righteousness consciousness. And the blood of Jesus has remitted our sin. The handwriting that has been held against us has been blotted out, done away with. Therefore, we don't have to make any more sacrifices for sin. So that means that we should not have a sin consciousness anymore, but a right standing with God consciousness now. Amen? I want to tell you what I mean. We as believers need to put away these sin tags. What's a sin tag? Here's one. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Has anyone else ever said that or heard that? I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. That's right. You were an old sinner. That's right. Thank God for his grace, but that's not who you are anymore. That's right. So we can't say those things anymore. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. That's telling you, you're telling yourself that I'm going to constantly live in a constant state of sin awareness. That is not what God intended. You were a sinner, but that is not who you are anymore. Hallelujah. Here's another sin tag we need to put away. A lot of you might connect with this one. I'm so unworthy. Whew, got quiet in here. I'm so unworthy. You wouldn't believe how many people have come to me over the years and said, Jesse, I'm not worthy enough to walk in divine healing. I'm not worthy enough to walk in divine prosperity. I'm not worthy enough to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and walk in his gifts. I, my, my past is so dirty. It's so black. It's so stained. It's so blotted. I'm so unworthy. No, you're not. No, you're not. You were worthy. You weren't even fit to associate with God, and that's why God sent his son for you to make you worthy and to get you back on his level in his class. You are now on God's level in his class because you are worthy. Stop saying you're unworthy. You'll say that your whole life and go nowhere spiritually. Go nowhere in life. You'll just spin in a circle. That is not what God had intended for you. Jesus died on the cross because he saw fit that you were worthy. Stop calling yourself unworthy. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God the Bible says that in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. The Amplified Bible says the handiwork of God. You know, you know what you all need to do in the morning? Wake up, look in that mirror and say, I've been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Look at me. Yes. Stand in front of your wife, guys, and say, I've been made the righteousness of God. I'm the handiwork of God. Yes. And watch her go. Pfft. And you can just say, I'm confessing the word. 
And when you confess the word, it makes Jesus smile. Amen? Yeah. You're just confessing the word. You are his workmanship. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you are his workmanship. You are the handy work of God. Don't let any devil talk you out of that. Once again, that scripture to write on your mirror is Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Hallelujah. And my God has never created anything unworthy. So we get in this position where we begin to realize that we have right standing with God. And church, when we have this realization, our prayer life has no choice but to change. We'll become so accurate knowing that we have been made the righteousness of God, so accurate in our prayer life that the moment we pray, it will be just as we prayed it. How does this affect your prayer life? The Bible says in James 5 and verse 16, James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Y'all have been in church. I like that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And you go to tell me that you're not righteous. You just told me your prayers don't avail much. You know what the Amplified Bible says there? I like this. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That's what the prayer of a man that's been made righteous will do, dynamic in its working, praise God. And you go to tell me that you're not the righteousness of God, then you just told me you don't wear a breastplate either. And that means that you just left the vital organs of your body wide open to the enemy who is seeking to kill still and destroy you. The breastplate, that breastplate just so happens to represent the blessed prey and be the breastplate of righteousness. And if you say you don't have or you're not the righteousness of God, then you're saying that, you know, you don't have a breastplate on. Paul talks about the whole armor of God. But do you know what the problem has been? The people that don't believe that they have been made the righteousness of God, when Satan attacks, they don't have a breastplate on and sometimes they don't even know where it is. They forget about being made the righteousness of God. And that breastplate is somewhere over in the closet. That shield, who knows where that shield is. That helmet, well, it's half crooked. The sword, hanging up there on the mantle. Rub it real good. Church, by the time you went and hung up all that armor, Satan's done and busted you real good. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He didn't say put on all the armor of God so you can take it off. He intends for you to keep it on, praise God. And church, when you know you get your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, you get that helmet of salvation on, praise God, and you know about that new birth, and you are wearing it as a helmet on your head, you get your loins girded with the belt of truth, and you strap on that breastplate of righteousness, that breastplate that God gave you, you get in all that armor and you strap it on real good. You might not be too comfortable when you put it on. It might be a little loose. You might rattle around in it. It's God's clothes. It's God's clothes. But church, when you get in all that armor and you put your shield on, you have that breastplate of righteousness, you put that stake in the ground and you pull that shield over that helmet, Satan doesn't know you from God. He thinks that's Jesus in all that armor because that's God's clothes. And the more we spend time in the Word of God, the Word of God, and get revelation of the armor of God, the more dangerous we get to the enemy. Yeah. Satan doesn't want you to know what the armor of God will do because he can't tell you apart from Jesus. It's God's clothes. It might be a little loose when you put it on. That's why we get in the Word. We fellowship with Jesus. He's our best friend. You talk to him just like your best friend. Yeah. Amen? And he begins to reveal these things to us, and we get more and more dangerous because we know the works of the devil. It's simple, that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's why Jesus gave us his armor, amen, to run him off. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's God's clothes that we're wearing. And did you notice the Apostle Paul didn't mention that there's anything on your backside concerning the armor of God? This is not retreat armor. It's attack armor. There's been too many Christians that have been retreating for too long, amen? I don't know about you, but I don't like those Christian retreats. No. I like those Christian charges, amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. There isn't a single thing on your backside. He didn't say put on all that armor just to run away. He said stand, and having done all to stand, you stand firm and quench all those fiery darts. Yes. And God's intention for the believer is that the darts never even reach him. And you lean hard on that righteousness. And church, you'll begin to be so righteousness conscious to the point you don't even stop and think about it. You just respond and act as a fact that you know you have been made the righteousness of God. And did you know this is what Jesus did at the tomb of Lazarus? He leaned on his righteousness. And folks, if you don't know your right standing with God, when you go to fooling with the dead, you're going to get beat. You have to know you have right standing. Amen? Amen. And these disciples that were with Jesus, they, had, they didn't have a revelation of righteousness, but Jesus did. They were sin conscious men. Jesus was right standing with God conscious. And do you, do you remember what he was, when he was told that news about Lazarus being sick? 
Did you notice when that sister came down there and told Jesus that Lazarus was sick, did you notice Jesus didn't jump up and say, Dear God, what are we going to do? He didn't even flinch. Amen? He wasn't moved one bit. A person that knows they have right standing with God never gets in a hurry, nor do they hesitate. Write that down. That's good. Somebody shot me down. (laughs) A person that knows they have right standing with God never gets in a hurry, nor do they hesitate. Why? Because they know how it's going to turn out. They know how it's going to turn out. They got right standing with God. He never got in a hurry, nor did he hesitate, and you never see him operating in fear at any time. Now, somebody might say, well, that's because he's the son of God. No, that's not why. It's because he leaned hard on the things that you and I have access to right now through Jesus Christ, and he pushed them to their limits. That sister came down there and told Jesus that Lazarus, about Lazarus, and guess what? Jesus heard that news and let him get two more days deader. Two more days. He didn't even flinch, wasn't moved. He just stayed where he was for two more days after he heard that news. You don't see Jesus jumping up in a tizzy, running as fast as he can because, man, by the second, he's getting more dead. He stayed there for two more days. And then it was time to go, and he told his disciples, all right, let's go to Judea. And his disciples said, Master. They couldn't believe what he was trying to tell them. Now, you see, you get an idea of what sin consciousness will produce. It will produce defeat. A righteousness consciousness will produce victory every time. And they said, Master, have you forgotten? The Jews of late have sought to destroy you the last time you were in Judea. And you mean to tell me we're going back? You want to go back there? You see what they got on their mind? Stones. Everyone say stones. Stones. A man that knows they have right standing with God, stones don't mean anything. Amen? They tried to stone Jesus and those disciples the last time they were there, and they remember it well. They just so happened to be with him. They got stones on their mind, not Lazarus, stones. And Jesus told them, he said, our friend Lazarus is asleep, and I go to awake him. And do you know what they said? Denise would say, well, bless their hearts. (laughs) They said, well, master, if he's asleep, then he's well, and we don't have to go to Judea, and we won't get stoned. Right? Right. They had stones on their mind. They don't care if Lazarus is asleep or not. They just know if they go to Judea, they're getting rocks. And Jesus finally told them plainly because they could not understand what he was saying. Jesus was talking faith, faith, faith the whole way. And finally, they were just so ignorant of what he was trying to get across to them. Jesus spoke plainly to them and said, Lazarus is dead. Then he said, now let's go. You can hear it in his voice, the frustration with these disciples. Now let's go that that I might raise him and the Son of God be glorified. Hallelujah. And do you know what old Thomas said? Let us all go that we may all die. (laughs) You know what he's got? He's got on his mind rocks. He's still thinking about them rocks. And you know what Jesus turned around and told him? Dear Lord, I'm glad for your sake I was not there so that when he died, so that you may believe. Church, he's going to have to do something great, pull off something amazing to get these boys to believe anything. They've got rocks on their mind so bad. It's all they're thinking about is rocks. Could care less about Lazarus. He's gone, Jesus. But the rocks, Lord. And when he got down there where Lazarus was, here comes Martha. Martha's having a hard time believing anything. And she said to him, oh, master, if you would have only been here, my brother would not have died. And he said, your brother shall rise again. She goes, oh, yes, I know. In the great resurrection, and Jesus drops the mic and he says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. (sighs) Gives me chills just saying it. Every time, every time I went over this, I just got chills. I am the resurrection. And he said, roll away the stone. In church, that's pushing righteousness to its limit. And here comes Mary. And Mary said, Lord, he stinks. He's been in there four days. And Jesus isn't moved by it one bit. But, you know, every one of us would have been beat right there and said, dear God, four days? You mean to tell me he didn't die 15 minutes ago? If I, if I was, would have been there, I probably would have said, hey, Lazarus, if you're in there, maybe scratch on the wall a little bit. Let us know you're okay. Nobody had faith, but Jesus knew. All the religious were standing there watching this preacher call the guy from the dead, and if he doesn't get it done, they're going to take away his license. He said, roll away the stone. And church, this is where we begin to separate the men from the boys right here. And this is where we begin to find out what righteousness, the righteousness of God will produce, and he leaned hard on it. Do you know what he said? He said, Father, I know you hear me, and you hear me always. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus had no other option but to come forth. Hallelujah. Church, he pushed that righteousness to its limit. Amen. 
We have to become so aware of our right standing with God that the very first sight of sickness, we don't even hesitate. We don't even think, will he or will he not? The very first sight of it, righteousness begins to well up on the inside of us and motivate us like it motivated Jesus and cause us to do the things that Jesus did and operate in the gifts that Jesus operated in because we have right standing with God. And the Bible says we are declaring his righteousness. We are declaring his righteousness. And it's because Jesus was resurrected. So let's resurrect a righteousness consciousness and thank Jesus for his righteousness to destroy the works of the devil every day. Amen. Wasn't that an incredible message? We're so glad that you tuned in today and you were able to join us at The Place Church where we love doing church as a family. Thank you so much for watching. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, as well as going to our website at www.h2hm.org you can find out all the different events, locations, and fun things that are coming up. We believe that when you partner with The Place, that you are seeing people reached and lives changed. All the information is also on your screen. Thank you so much for watching, and know that we are believing for God's best in your life.